Hello, random stranger. How have we all been? Um, first off, a shout out to all of the Californians who might be watching this. I am aware and know that the usual time that I post these reactions is usually very late for you guys. So I just wanted to let you know that I see you and that I appreciate you being here. Um, as well as everyone else too, I know that it's been another few weeks without Kayon. Um, the bright side is that we get to extend the time that we have left with these girls. Not that I intend on dragging it out any more than I have to. Um, it's just I've been away from home traveling. But we are back now and we are here to celebrate the power of dreams. So uh, Kayon has always had this underlying message to follow your dreams. And here I want to appreciate the how the current op and the ed go all out on that theme so despite both songs having very different musical styles and tempos and very much reflecting the different personalities between yui and Mio, lyrically they both reinforce the same message so both talk about uh, singing your soul out about living in and feeling the moment and about making the most of your youth and also just like letting out your dreams through music and so they're both very unapologetic which I love and I mean the ED literally has a line that translates into you can't diss the power of dreaming. Uh, I want to thank RedlerRed7 for leaving the most insightful comment on the intricate details of both the OP and the ED. I'll, I'll read some of it here, but um, I'd really encourage you guys to check it out in full. So on the OP they wrote, it reads like an advertisement for the Light Music Club, specifically one made by the girls themselves. You see this most clearly when you look at the multiple V-logger jump cuts over the course of the verse. The part where the guitars right before the verse also depicts random shenanigans that the characters get up to as if the camera was placed on a stand and they were all told to do something entertaining. Moogie tries to do her sunfish impress impression, not seal, which I don't know why I thought it was a seal, right before Ritsu stops her, for example. That part is my favourite part, by the way, um, especially after we got that great elaboration on their relationship in episode 14. So um, there's also some really cool details that uh, Red the Red 7 points out, like how Mia is the only one who writes her name card using English or using the Latin letters, which fits in very well with her intellectual aura. And the fact that at the end, when they all pounce on Nautica to give her that group hug, and how Nautica just like sort of anticipates it and goes as stiff as a board uh, and her glasses fall off. All of that, even just in the OP, just goes to show how much thought has been given into giving these characters not just the perception of depth, but actual depth. And I've spoken about this a few times before, but for a lot of other shows that I watch, there's lots happening in the plot and in the world where the story is set, which I do enjoy, but more and more, I think because of K-On!, I think I much prefer watching a show where sometimes quote unquote nothing is going on, but it's because the characters and their interactions with each other that make the real show. And Kaon actually, it actually reminds me of one of my favorite books ever called A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tows. And it's an exquisite book about a Russian aristocrat who gets arrested and sentenced to live in this luxury ho hotel for life. And the book, I mean, stuff happens, but because the entire world is encompassed in this one hotel, the brilliance of it is in how the main character meets other people and develops relationships with them and just notices all these tiny, beautiful details of life that you would miss if you just blinked and I really recommend it if you're a book lover and I guess my point is that Kayon is in that same style of savoring the 
poetry of humanity wherever it is that you can find it and I think that that's just absolutely awesome um, anyway yes yeah, so Radler Red 7 had some great insights into the lyrics as well for the OP uh, yeah they put it better than I could so the lyrics talk about uh, overpowering the feeling of your life being on autopilot by singing about love and happiness and friendship and all of that mushy girly stuff. It's an encouraging pat on the back and a smile saying every day can be fun. Every day can give you joy. And then uh, for the ED's lyrics, they wrote, I think one of the translations has a line to the effect of I'm not growing up, which paints a strange picture for the song when you take the rest of the lyrics in question. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to know for sure what the lyrics say when you don't really know the original Japanese. Uh, but then they go on to write, if I was going to take a guess, I'd probably put it like, I don't want to grow up bitter and unhappy, always looking back longingly at the memories of my youth, which seems to fit the general tone of the song. That's not what I want. No, thank you. So yeah, there you go. Thank you for those awesome and just very thoughtful notes. Um, okay, I think... There's some extra notes as well that I have for the episodes themselves. Uh, let's start with episode 15, The Marathon, which served up some classic K-On humor. And what I really loved about this episode was how each of the girls' motivations for running really reflects their different, unique personalities. So with Yui, she just didn't want to do it. <laughs> and kept going on about how she wants the mochi but she hates that they have to actually make it to the end of the finish line before they get it and she's shocked that everyone else around her is trying so hard and at of course like at the end it's the horror of how there might not be any mochi left that gets her ass moving at light speed and just causes the eruption of the mochi war of 2010. So it all reminds us that she's still the same Yui that we've always known. She really needs to be passionate about something. For example, like the Light Music Club or her friends for her to even lift a finger in effort. And Ritsu like really painted a succinct, a succinct picture of Yui when she's watching her get distracted by everything. And, and then she says like, you know, even with all the stamina and endurance in all the world, could there be any girl that is less cut out for a marathon? Speaking of Ritsu, it was incredibly Slytherin and utilitarian of her when she agrees with Yui that it's so dumb, this marathon, but her reason is because, well, there's not even a prize for the winner. And so there has to be some cutthroat competition or a threat to her dominance for her to care. And then for Mia, it's all about not finishing last. So there's not all of that attention on her. It's about, you know, as is so typical of our bassist, about staying out of the spotlight and ultimately not letting her fan base grow even more, which I think at this point is impossible because everything she does is cool no matter what. And I love that she hates that. Uh, there was a key point as well that Mio made when they were trying to conquer Heartbreak Hill. And it's when Yui complains that an arts and culture club like theirs is at a huge disadvantage. And then Mio just smiles and says, well, our club has its own way of doing things. It was just another nice line in there that speaks to the immediate context that they're in the marathon but also rings true for the girls in terms of what they choose to value so it's it's always friendships over developing perfect musical technique even though they are a great band um, and it also works in a more meta context in that k -On was a show developed very much in its own way and at least from what I know was a very key pioneer in the slice of life genre and really set the template for a lot of shows that came afterwards. Another highlight of the episode for me was when Ritsu and Mugi pretend to be lost and they are literally on the side of the road um, and Mio just lets them. So either they both thought they were lost in which case I bow down to their infinite imaginations or they were just totally playing off each other and knowingly indulging in their fantasies which is just equally as great 
And it was just, it was also good to see that Ritsu's protective side comes out in life and death survival situations. Um, one final note that led really well into the next episode, it's when they found Yui at Obachan's place and they all know that they're going to finish dead last in this race, but they don't really care. Uh, except for Mio, but that's only because of the whole attention thing. So this attitude of taking things easy and enjoying all the stops along the way and, and not really worrying about the end result um, because what matters is who you're on that journey with. All of that was like a nice hint at episode 16 where Azusa worries that all they ever do is these rest stops. So, okay, let's quickly talk about episode 16. The episode which hints at the infinite possibilities of pairing Azusa off with each of her senpais, which I appreciated a lot because Azusa has spent most of the time with Yui, so it was just nice to see what changes when she interacts with the different other girls. The episode hinges on how embarrassed Azusa is about how overly relaxed the HTT club is. So you have Jun asking Azusa what a typical day is like in the club and Azusa flat out lies. <laughs> and I loved how perceptive Jun was seeing right through Azusa when she tried to make out as if they have lots of meetings but it's you know really meetings where they just have tea and cake. So all throughout the episode there's this titanic struggle on Azusa's part um, this real fear that she's forgetting who she really is the more time she spends with the other girls. But then the beauty of this episode is that she gets to interact one-on-one -on -one with each of the senpais and realizes that it's not that she's no longer herself, it's just that life is happening. She's growing up and growing with these girls, um, these amazing girls, and she wouldn't have it any other way. So let's talk uh, Azusa and Mugi. I mean, strike me down, but I really saw so much potential ship material in there. To summarize their dynamic, it would be sensible, realist, Slitherclaw meets dreamy, adorable Hufflepuff. And it was fascinating seeing how Azusa's nervousness around Mugi um, you know, because of her perceived sophistication and, to quote Azusa, her amazing huge eyes and fair skin, how that just melts away and then it turns into Azusa seeing the childlike idealism of Mugi and just gushing over how cute that is to Jun and Ui afterwards. And there's even some meta commentary that goes on with the other three eavesdropping on them. And Ritsu says out loud, oh, you two had a very interesting dynamic going on there. So, I mean, I just think that Azusa plays really well off the more touchy-feely types, whether it's Yui or Mugi. So no matter how much she denies it, you can tell that she's really drawn to that type. And there were so many golden moments in that interaction with, you know, Azusa putting the guitar strap around Mugi's neck and then wiping off the icing from her cheek, getting embarrassed when Jun teases her about looking forward to Mugi's tea every day. And yeah, it was just like real ship fodder, but also it was just a wonderful, realistic contrast of personalities. By the way, I really love that after every meaningful interaction with her senpais, Azusa has like a debriefing session with Ui and Jun. It just it kind of fortifies their bond, which is great because we know that they're going to be the next generation light music club. Um, so moving on, uh, Azusa with Mio was also great. I found the way Azusa just sat there staring at Mio in this very uncomfortable way was really interesting because she's probably thinking about how, you know, being with Mio is her best chance at staging a comeback and that she's always identified the most with Mio. She even comments that, you know, sitting here, it feels like a real light music club, doesn't it? To which a very confused Mio replies, well, I thought that we were a real light music club. So um, there was a comment on this 
Yeah, so from Dr. Bustable, which I thought summarized uh, really well what's happening here, they wrote, I love the moment where Azusa offers to make the tea. And just episode 16 in general, it's one of the moments where you don't notice the changes in yourself until you look back on who you were before it all started. So while music and practicing has always been her focus, Azusa forgets that it was the bond they have that drew her to them in the first place a bond that she is now part of whether she likes it or not uh yeah a hundred percent that you know i feel like as a sir is a, a conduit for us the viewers because so often i'll look back on who i was before i watched this show you know the skeptic of all things cute and i'm amazed at how attached I've become to the characters and to K-On. Um, I'm also very similar to Azusa in that I will rave about K-On to my friends and I get sad at the thought of being left behind when it's all over. Um, but anyway, <laughs> let's get off that sad note and onto a more cultural one. So the yeah, there's a cultural note on Azusa offering to make the tea. So both of them, both Azusa and Mia, are just too polite to refuse the making of the tea once the suggestion is out there. Mia is like, well, if you really want to, I don't mind. And Azusa who actually wants to practice but can't go back on it now because she's put it out there, <laughs> can only very indirectly say, oh, you know, it's just a suggestion. It's just a suggestion. You know, you don't have to if you don't want to. And I live through those kinds of very indirect beating around the bush over polite conversations every single day as an Asian. And interestingly, it shows that there's still some distance between Azusa and Mio, not in a bad way. It's just so obvious that later on when Azusa is with Yui, and she just straight up tells Yui to you know stop singing or stop doing this or doing that. It shows that Azusa is far more comfortable with Yui than with Mio. So next was the whole Ritsu home cooking part. First of all, let me say that there's a clear parallel between Ui helping Yui finish her homework assignment and then Ritsu immediately rushing to Mio for that same purpose, just showing how Ritsu and Mio are essentially family already. And then secondly, Ritsu is damn lucky to have both Mio and Mugi help her with her assignment. I mean, just like imagine having those two to call on at any time. So <laughs> Helena Anhos did some fantastic analysis on this part of the episode, one that really honed in on the Mitsu angle of things. Uh, they write, I love how the portion set at Ritsu's house demonstrates just how at home Mio feels there. She is the only one of the girls aside from Ritsu to take both her jacket and her sweater off. And her shirt, although still tucked, is messily so. She greets Satoshi when he comes out of the bathroom and though he feels shy around the other girls, he has no problem talking directly to Mio when Ritsu asked for them to come down. When Azusa says she's going to the bathroom, it's Mia who asks her if she knows where it is, like she herself is the hostess. Unlike the others, she doesn't look surprised when Ritsu reveals that she made dinner and Ritsu even asks her if she has her tea. It's clear she eats Ritsu's cooking with some sort of regularity. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving sustenance to my shipper heart. The, yeah, the part where Ritsu asked Mio about her tea confused me for a moment because I thought that it would be something that you ask everyone at the table like oh you know do you guys want some tea with your rice but when I re-watched it it read much more like oh you know Mio do you have your tea that you always have when you come over here which is all the time so it was so cute um Another little cultural thing that I found really funny, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with stereotypical Asian culture, the part where Ritsu makes a really big deal about how if you're Japanese, you must have rice. It's a very common Asian dad stereotype. The, the fact that for main meals, it's 
it's always the dad that demands, you know, the traditional Asian cooking and it's not a proper meal if it doesn't have rice. There's none of that pasta stuff or pizza or mashed potatoes, whatever. You go rice or you get out. So where Ritsu is sitting as well is traditionally where the Asian dad sits, like, you know, at the head of the table. And then Mio in that very familiar tone, like the, oh, there she goes again tone, just says, oh, you like your rice, don't you, Ritsu? And it's just such a mum thing to do. And because usually it's the mums that don't really care whether or not we're having rice. And okay, so these are stereotypes, guys. So obviously it's not true for every Asian family, but it's definitely true in mine and it's true for a lot of my friends. So it was just funny to see that random husband wife scenario playing out with Ritsu and Mio. So after all that, Jun teases Azusa again the next day about boasting about having tried Ritsu's home cooking, which traumatizes Azusa and then Jun laughs it off and just reassures her with the iconic line of the episode, which is, you know, it's okay, every journey needs some rest stops. But as Asa feels, the problem is that rest stops are all they ever do, which leads us to the final boss or the, the final interaction, which is with Yui. And interestingly, when Yui gets distracted by Ton Chan and all of that, um, as Asa thinks to herself, oh, I'm getting infected by her slacker attitude again, which is the only time as I said, every ever directly singles out any of her senpais for being slack. If she's done it before, it's usually, you know, they're being slackers or their slacker attitude. But with Yui, as I said before, she doesn't shy away at all from telling us straight up to like, you know, stop singing that weird song of yours when they're scrubbing Tonchan's tank. And then she whips up Mio's famous line, you know, we're going to practice no ifs or buts or ands. And then generally you can tell that even though Azusa has closed the gap between her and the other three senpais a bit, quite a bit, with Yui, the gap was long ago eviscerated. And that's because right from the start, Yui had latched onto Azusa immediately like both physically and emotionally but in the episode since Azusa was introduced she's also gone equal distance closer to Yui um, which is really sweet and ironically it's with Yui that Azusa actually gets some music practice or like music theory done and not only that it was Yui being proactive about it which was a miracle and it's just a great reversal and then the conversation happens when Yui asks why Azusa is so gung-ho about practice all of a sudden. And then Azusa answers, well, you could say that this is the real me. And, you know, she starts to freak out about having been off her game for so long. But Yui just pulls out the most calm, reassuring words of all, just sharing honestly how she sees life. And so Yui has always been a free spirit and she is who she is. She's never been limited by any set in stone idea of what she should be. And same with Azusa. She's like, Azusa is Azusa. And by implication, it means that Azusa can relax and not worry so much about fitting into a certain mold of who Azusa is. So um, to finish off this recap of episode 13, there was another great comment from Impossible. They wrote, I really like episode 16. Nothing much happens, yet a lot happens. Azusa searching for her identity is all kinds of relatable. Yep. She has this fear that she will lose what she is if she takes in too much of the others. All of that happens to most people when they're young, but probably throughout life too. Our shared world is such a bizarre place that questioning one's place in it is healthy and a natural thing. Yeah, so at the end of the day, growing up is not only about learning to be comfortable in your own skin, but also to be comfortable with change. And um, the way that they finished off the episode really carried that message through. 
Um, by using these everyday objects that when placed into the context of the story come to mean so much. So the stickers, right? So all throughout the episode you see as a sub being all, well, can we get rid of them now? But at the end, when the older girls um, very nicely give Azusa Sawako's a uh, piece of dessert, Yui's stuck a, a like Azinyan sticker on the bottom and Azusa finally accepts it. Like these girls have left a mark on her and they've become a part of her and Azusa is fine with it. She's actually, well, happy about it. There's also the the keychain, the one that the older girls got for Azusa while they were away on a trip and it gets found and then you see Azusa putting it back on her bag and then my favorite shot is where you see all of the bags lined up and Azusa's bag just, just sort of falls onto the one next to it, just symbolizing her becoming an integral part of the family. So the shot of all the different clubs was great too, just a really neat tie-in with what Mio said in the previous episode, which is that the Light Music Club is unique and will do things its own way. And now we have two more new episodes to watch. Okay, wow, I apologize for that really long <laughs> chat, guys, but we are now ready to head to episode 17, No Club Room. So if you guys are ready to start this, let's do it in three two, one, play. <laughs> now they're all gung-ho, it's not just as a sir. Not a car. Does that actually happen? <laughs> I did know an uncle who drank so much carrot juice that he turned bright orange. Eh? <laughs> Who's taking it? Maybe it's the jazz club. I love how they're throwing this impromptu concert in their classroom on top of these desks. Also, I'd like to point out the way that Mugi plays the chords on the piano. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not really done like that, but it just goes to show how classy and sophisticated she is. <laughs> And also, I love this part where they're trying to sync it together and be perfect, but just that message again, like they may not be the most perfect and technically exquisite of bands, but they do things their own way and it turns out the best anyway. Like that's just their style. It doesn't matter if they're not perfect. Oh, I do wonder if they're setting up a conflict between the jazz club and the light music club. It's a lot more people in the jazz club too. But it doesn't matter. Those five girls are a force. Oh, okay. It's just plumbing. Sawako. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Just gotta love how dramatic Sawako Sensei is about everything. They could use Mugi's house, one of her houses. Mm. 
Wait, is Jun there? They just practice on the stairs, I guess. Oh, I get to meet some of the other characters, the extras. What are they doing there? They're like studying? <laughs> the thank you in English. They do play better with an audience, so maybe this might be good. Oh, that's a new song. Is that Moogie's song? The one that she wrote a while ago? The Japanese are so polite. <laughs> oh, baton twirling. Wow. I don't know, Jim. <laughs> uh, and her muscles. Yes, it is a bit weird. Interesting. Yes, no, surely no one can beat Yui on enthusiasm. So cute. A tribe of nomads. I bet Mugi is loving this. <laughs> I mean, this is showcasing a very important character that often doesn't get noticed, which is the music room itself. <gasps> Brezu. Too sweet. <laughs> That's some snow white stuff. Oh, 
no. She once she gets stuck into that depressive hole of hers. Oh, a lyrics competition. Yes. It's more revealing of their characters. Like we know what Mio writes at this point. I love how as such a cuts them down when she has to. It's the tea, it's the lack of tea that's draining her energy. And maybe even record a few tracks as well. McGee? <laughs> Where did they get all that money from again? Not from Sawako because Sawako took that money back. Maybe it's all the membership fees from Mio's fan club. interesting version of this song that's going on in the background. Yep, just look at her forehead, the one and only Ritsu. Whenever those two say something in unison, it's very powerful. <laughs> what is Monkey doing? Oh, is she making tea in the corner? I can hear that tea pouring sound. <laughs> Muggy just taking care of the stuff that matters. Oh. It's that mirror. Oh, I thought it was like a... <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you're going to squeeze any practice out of those girls until they have the tea. <laughs> this is going to be an actual song. The whole thing with rice that they've been setting up. Oh, Gohan. Okay. Nice pun. It's amazing. <laughs> this is our detective fantasy. It's got 
very like Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> going to be amazing, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, I wasn't thinking about Tonchan, but and you know what? It's actually kind of very similar to what Mio writes when she's in one of those moods. <laughs> Red Sea. Yep, still in the animal swamp. Oh no. There we go. That's the message. She drove all the way there to just tell them that, you know, this teacher is pretty, pretty sweet. Aside from all the weird, you know, costume fantasies. What was that drawing on the whiteboard? Who is that meant to be? Azus and Yui? <laughs> mm. Appreciate what's right in front of you. Oh, is you, are we going to do some editing? <laughs> uh, it is cute how she finds everything Yui does as amazing. I mean, original is a word that can cover all manner of sins. Uh, so we're going to get a song about rice. Thank you, Ui. Second time someone's told her that. I love how she just zones out. Oh, 
out. <laughs> oh no, she went all out on those lyrics. Oh no, poor girl. <laughs> the all four of them are like, oh my gosh, you cannot leave Ui alone with Yui. <gasps> Ritsu's hair is adorable. I just noticed it. out <laughs> oh such good friends they were just rushed over there Ah, uh, yep, there you go. I love how they take a simple message, like don't take anything for granted and then just express it in all of these different uh, ways. And the house is still there, <laughs> it didn't burn down. It's a miracle. Oh, she actually made the porridge. It must be all cold though, by <laughs> now. She wrote a song about her sister. You and I, it's pretty genius. Yeah, she wrote it on her own too. Oh no! It's <laughs> so funny. It is true. Like I think what ninety five percent of their songs have all been written by Mio, and then the odd song written by Mugi, like lyrically. It must feel weird for Mio then to suddenly have Yui just come out of nowhere. <laughs> So real, those dynamics in a band about who does what. Oh, I love that H that's hidden in the back. The one H in red. Yes, yeah, someone in the comments as well uh, pointed out that there's some matching clothing going on as well in this ED. So you've got Mio and Ritsu in the hoodies and then Yui and Azusa in the tank tops. It's very, very cool. Okay. 
All right, uh, on to episode 18. And uh, yeah, it was Oliver Yayaro. Thank you for pointing out the matching clothing in the ED. So if you guys are good to go, let's play this in three, two, one, go. Leading role. Are you voting for Mio? <laughs> She's gonna die. She's dead already. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Romeo and Juliet. Guys, that was the last thing I was expecting. Shakespeare play, right? Like, we are talking about Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Yes? <laughs> interesting, interesting. I love how Mio's doing the, the thumb trick. I'm so intrigued now. I love Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. Well, Romeo and Juliet is not my favorite. Um, Hamlet probably is that. But Mia as Romeo is going to be... I don't know how that's going to play out. Wait, so who is going to be Juliet then? I also love, okay, so during that, when they're doing this over the strawberry, I love that it's Mio and Ritsu together again for that segment as well. Well, whoever gets um, Juliet's part, Ritsu is going to be really jealous of them, no? Ah. Uh... Okay, I can't wait. <laughs> and everyone voted for meal. Uh, it was funny. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't even... It did not even cross my mind that this is how it would turn out. Hmm. Oh. Oh, that was the girl from last episode. Oh, the Yuri goggles come out. What is she thinking? Oh. This is amazing. Oh no, she wants to do the costumes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Poor it's a meal, but also I love where this is going. <laughs> I, th <sighs> you know, okay, so 
Ritsu as Romeo and then Mia as Juliet makes more intuitive sense, but... And Yui is the tree. <laughs> the perfect role, the role she was born to play. You know, I this just validates my theory that amongst the K-On writing staff, there were some hardcore Mitsu shippers because this just reads like a total fanfic episode. <laughs> I mean, it's fanfic that I don't have to write anymore because the K-On writers already did it. It is going to be so hard for me, though. No. <laughs> Worst possible thing you could say. Oh no, she's shutting down. What is happening? She's running to the depths of her imagination, the only place of escape. Wow. <laughs> uh, Ritsu's like, if I have to suffer, you are suffering along right with me. Forward freak. <laughs> oh, you're doing a good job, Yui. I can't, is this actually happening? I think she'd even have trouble playing a tree, to be honest. Yep, appeal to her sense of responsibility. Go, Nautica. Mookie with a script. <laughs> the whole class. Is Mookie on a power trip? Just making the most out of life, McGee. I feel like they need to tap into their normal Mio and Ritsu chemistry and then it'll all be fine. It's Shakespeare for you. <laughs> what a pair. Oh my god, this is amazing. So everyone chose Mia because she's cool and there's a certain image of her in everyone's mind. And then, of course, if Mia was Romeo, then everyone was like, well, of course. Ritsu has to be Juliet. <sighs> so 
So basically they have to be each other. <laughs> Like Mia. Oh no. Yeah. Like Ritzy. <laughs> As a sub, what are you thinking? Yeah, that's a bit hard. <laughs> Oh, Mia looks so different. <laughs> Mia looks great like that though, like I don't know, you kind of feel things <laughs> with that shirt tucked out. Why don't they just like swap roles? You know what I mean? Like, why doesn't Litsu just do Romeo and vice versa? I love how this is calling back to when Ritsu helped me all with her public speaking as well. Oh, that is such hard dialogue. So cute. I cannot handle this. Uh, thank you. That is what I said. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. So by pretending to be the other person being the role. <laughs> it's so convoluted how they do this, all just to show how well they know each other. It's working though, isn't it? It's because it's in front of everyone else. Oh. <sighs> this is so shippy. Oh, why doesn't she do the, um, potato thing or the pineapple thing you know imagine everyone's a pineapple What evil has Mugi planned? Is that her house? Oh. Oh. 
Oh, that's not half bad, that idea. Oh, it's a maid cafe. <laughs> Oh, the, oh my God. This is just fulfilling every single meal fantasy. This is so weird, weird and surreal. Well, remember Mugi has been serving customers for a while now in her fast food job. Oh, they're very natural as well. I love how she yells Nakano at Azusa. Damn, so it's a lot of effort for a school play. You can do it. They'll probably give her extra tips because they think she's so cute. Yui. <laughs> there you go. Okay. What was that smile on Ritzy's face? It's like she's very proud of Mio for breaking barriers like this. Or oh, it was like, yeah, she is cute. <laughs> No, she'd just get really pissed off. Hmm. Yeah, it's got to be a very specific set of conditions. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ritzy. <laughs> Well, she does know Mio the most. Of course it was. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's canon.
Oh no, that's that's bad. This is when she's totally gone back into her shell. <laughs> Regrets. Ritsu experiences regret. Is this a classic case of when an introvert is forced to act like an extrovert? And they do really well, but it actually kills them inside. <laughs> it's all for nothing. <laughs> See, again, there's that, like, knowing smile on Ritsu's face. As a sir, just shaking her head. Oh, I. Oh, okay. So it continues on in the next episode, like the actual play. I hope so. I, I mean, never in my wildest dreams did it occur to me that we might actually see a Romeo and Juliet reproduction with Mio and Ritsu. <laughs> wow. I mean, again, I'm just going to state for the record the just how complicated that plot line was and the whole uh, Mio pretending to be Ritsu, pretending to be Romeo and the other way around as well. It just... <laughs> Look, if the plot compl complications is used to develop a ship that I really like, and I think have such great chemistry, then I'm all for plot complexity. <laughs> like, it was just so cute as well how uh, Mio could do all of the lines and stuff and the dialogue just in front of Ritsu, but as soon as there's another person involved, she just completely falls apart. All right. Hey guys, so Kaon did it again. I enjoyed myself immensely with these two episodes. My favorite moments from each. So episode 17, it was how the plot involved using very simple everyday events to, you know, like having a water leak in the ceiling and then Ui getting sick to bring about uh, a realization in the characters that you should never take things for granted. It's only when certain things are gone that you realize how much you actually rely on them and need them. So that was just a great simple message and an extension of something that we have already been focusing on in season two, which is to appreciate the moment in front of you. Episode 18. Oh my goodness. As a Mitsu shipper, obviously, I enjoyed every single awkward moment that Ritsu and Mio had to fight through in their journey to become Romeo and Juliet. I loved that moment that they shared on, I think it was Ritsu's bed, where they're just at a total loss as to what they should do. And then all of a sudden, the answer has been right in front of their faces the whole time. And that is to get into the mindset of their better half and to imagine what the other person would do. And then it's like magic. So they just had to tap into what they already know, um, which is that they know each other inside and out. And honest to God, they are true soulmates. And I just love that the Kaon writers, for whatever reason, 
just allowed their inner Mitsu shipping selves to run wild with this plot line. So that brings us to the end of another reaction and I really look forward to seeing or hearing what you guys thought about these two episodes. Um, I will see you guys in the not so distant future to watch what is shaping up to be a pretty epic next episode. Uh, until then guys, take care and have a great rest of the week.